Hi there, biologists. This is Mr. Workman. This is your screencast session two for your unit on biotechnology. Uh, as you begin this unit, make sure you're ready to take some notes. Uh, and I would advise that you get out your learning target list, uh, pages seven and eight in your unit booklet. In uh, Mr. Gale's learning targets and Mr. Workman's learning targets, target 11, target 22, 25, 27, and 31 are all applicable to this particular screencast session. This screencast session is going to highlight um, what we call RFLP, or Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism Analysis, more commonly known as your DNA fingerprint. And uh, there are two other techniques that I'm going to talk about today that you need to do in order to do a DNA fingerprint, and that's called PCR, which is known as polymerase chain reaction, and gel electrophoresis. So we're going to uh, um, discuss those two, uh, uh, actually three techniques today. So let's get going. Um, <clears throat> what you're seeing right here is an imprint of a fingerprint, but DNA fingerprinting has nothing to do with your actual physical fingerprint. And if you know anything about uh, your own body here, uh, your fingerprints uh, are unique patterns of swirls and lines and deltas and all their different patterns of um, structures on the tips of your fingers. And when you touch something, um, you leave behind a fingerprint and fingerprints are commonly used in crime scene analysis so that you can identify who was doing what uh, in the act of a crime in some instances. When we do a DNA fingerprint we actually look at uh, crime scene evidence in some instances, uh, blood or other body fluids that can be left behind in a crime scene, and we do a DNA analysis so as to determine um, potentially who the victim is or you know who this who the uh, criminal was or the alleged criminal was um, and try to correlate that with the suspect or in some instances we can do DNA fingerprinting to figure out um, who's the father in a paternity case there's other reasons we can do this but those are just a few and when you do a DNA fingerprint um, it's not like a physical fingerprint you get this cartoonish, uh, this is a cartoonish representation of a pattern of DNA structures that are run across a gel. Now we're going to talk about how that um, works here coming up. <clears throat> so RFLP, or Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism Analysis, or doing a DNA fingerprint, really is something that we use to look at the differences in different people's DNA. And um, when we cut up uh, one person's DNA, say my DNA, compared to your DNA with restriction enzymes, it's going to result in different size fragments because the restriction sites in my DNA might differ in frequency or in where they are in my DNA compared to yours. And when we cut up our DNA with the same restriction enzyme, those different fragments can be displayed in a pattern and um, those patterns can identify us as one uh, person or another person as the case may be. This is a quick animation on DNA fingerprinting or restriction fragment length polymorphism. But before I show you that animation, I want you to know these three basic steps. To do a restriction fragment length polymorphism or RFLP or DNA fingerprint, you need to first of all get DNA. You need to obtain it. Um, and then you need to, in some instances, copy it, make many, many copies of it so that you can do the next step, which is to cut it up into different sizes using restriction enzymes, and then run it on what we call a gel using uh, a technique we call gel electrophoresis. So here's a quick animation. Uh, take a look at this <clears throat> and um, see what you think. Restriction enzymes recognize very specific sequences of nucleotides in DNA. DNAs from different individuals rarely have exactly the same array of restriction sites and distances between these sites. Therefore, the population is said to be polymorphic having many forms for these restriction fragment patterns. These differences are referred to as restriction fragment length polymorphisms, RFLPs. Such differences may arise through mutations. By cutting a DNA sample with a particular restriction enzyme, DNA fragments of different length are obtained. These fragments are separated by gel electrophoresis. This provides a pattern of bands that is unique for the particular DNA being analyzed. These DNA fingerprints are used in forensic science during criminal investigations. RFLPs are also useful as markers to identify particular groups of people at risk for certain genetic disorders. All right, <clears throat> so let's get back to our presentation here. 
Um, let's talk about the first step of producing an RFLP, and that, of course, is obtaining the DNA, which is more technically known as DNA extraction. And I'll tell you, this is going to be a lab that we will do in class. We're going to um, <clears throat> extract our own DNA from our cheek cells. And there's three main reasons why you want to um, ever um, dis extract DNA from an individual um, or from uh, evidence, as the case may be. One is a uh, forensic reason. And forensics, I know many of us at Downers Grove South think of forensics as speech, but forensic science is really the science of analyzing crime scenes to try to determine who a suspect might have been to who actually perpetrated a crime <clears throat> or um, analyze and figure out who a victim might be if they're unidentifiable for some reason. Uh, another reason to do DNA extraction is for a medical test. If you want to test a patient or potentially a newborn to see if they have a gene that's correlated with a, a disease. And then the third reason is uh, to study. If we know of some genes that are correlated with disease and we want to study them, well, we need to first get the DNA from an individual who has that gene in order to do the study. When you extract DNA, there are four main steps of DNA extraction, and the first step is to collect cell samples. Um, and when you do DNA extraction yourself, you're going to collect your own cells from the inside of your cheeks, as is pictured here. And once you collect those cells, what you have to do is get at the DNA. So what you have to do is actually break apart the cell membranes and the nuclear membrane. And that process we call lysis, or if you lyse, L-Y-S-E, here's the term right here, lysing the cell membrane allows us to get at the interior cell components. Then what we need to do is separate the DNA or the nucleic acid material from the other cellular components. And one way of doing that is to introduce your busted up cell solution to a very, very high salt concentration solution. And then finally, what you need to do is precipitate the DNA. And DNA does not dissolve well in alcohol. So if you introduce a very cold alcohol solution to your solution containing DNA, the DNA will precipitate out and get this cloudy form. And we'll see that when we do this in, in class. <clears throat> the next step of uh, producing your RFLP is to do um, what we call polymerase chain reaction. And this reaction uh, is what it is, is implied by the name. Polymerase, of course, is an enzyme that polymerizes um, DNA nucleotides. And a chain reaction implies that it keeps going and going and going. And the purpose of polymerase chain reaction, of course, is to amplify or make a huge amount of your DNA gene so that you can study it further. Uh, this is a quick animation describing polymerase chain reaction. The polymerase chain reaction is a method for making many copies of a specific segment of DNA, starting with a very small amount. This technique can be used to identify specific microorganisms from a small amount of DNA, and to identify persons involved in crimes from DNA on cigarettes or in a single hair follicle. The DNA to be amplified is mixed with deoxyribonucleotides, a thermal stable DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase, and DNA primers. The DNA primers hybridize to the ends of the gene to be amplified and provide a starting point for the TAC polymerase. The mixture is heated to break the hydrogen bonds in the DNA, forming single-stranded molecules. The mixture is then cooled sufficiently to allow the DNA primers to anneal to each end. As you're looking at this, new nucleotides are going to be added to the old uh, template strands in a complementary base pairing way. And I wonder in what direction the new nucleotides will be synthesized. Hmm. I wonder if we studied this direction of newly synthesis of DNA polynucleotides when we talked about DNA replication. Hmm. And of the segment to be copied. TAC polymerase then synthesizes the complementary strand of DNA using the primer as the starting point. The temperature is raised again to separate the DNA strands and then lowered sufficiently to allow the primers to attach. TAC polymerase now synthesizes another set of new complementary strands. This process is repeated until enough DNA has been produced to be identified or used for further research. After 21 cycles, one molecule of DNA can be amplified to over a million copies. This amount of amplification can be achieved by running the reaction overnight in a thermal cycler 
an instrument that automatically raises and lowers the temperature at appropriate time intervals. <clears throat> so as we look at this image, this is a thermocycler, and um, what it is is basically a complicated machine that heats up and cools down and heats up and cools down at a regular cycle. And uh, in this region of the machine here are these little um, metal wells, and into those metal wells you can put your test tubes that contain your DNA that needs to be copied, free DNA nucleotides, your TAC polymerase, and DNA primers, and the molecule is self-replicating and you just heat it up to unzip it and then you cool it down and the new nucleotides fill in according to complementary base pairing rules um, as the molecule cools down with the assistance of the the TAC polymerase molecule. So these machines are not inexpensive but it's a commonly used technique to amplify the amount of DNA so that you can then do the next step which of course is to study the DNA. Um, using what we call gel electrophoresis. Now this is an uh, animation, it's about four minutes that explains to you how gel electrophoresis works. These tubes contain identical DNA fragments, but they will be cleaved with different restriction enzymes to yield fragments of different sizes. Enzyme 1 cuts the DNA into fragments A and B, which we color for tracking purposes. Enzyme 2 cleaves the DNA at a different recognition sequence, yielding fragments C and D. Adding both enzymes yields fragments A, E, and D. Gel electrophoresis is one of the most useful means of separating and purifying DNA fragments for further analysis. In this technique, a jello-like slab of material called agarose is molded with wells, placed in a buffer solution, and hooked up to positive and negative electrodes. The DNA solutions, to which blue dye is added, are then pipetted into the wells. A well is also reserved for the placement of DNA of known sizes, and then the power supply is turned on. The blue tracking dye is negatively charged and migrates toward the positive electrode, as does the DNA. The DNA backbones contain negatively charged phosphate groups, which are attracted to the positive electrode. The smallest fragments move the fastest, being entangled less in the agarose matrix of the gel. When the blue dye reaches the bottom of the gel, the power is turned off. A fluorescent dye is then used to stain the DNA fragments. A DNA fragment in the size standards lane is the smallest, in this case about 500 base pairs, followed by DNA fragment D. The largest fragment is 23,000 base pairs long. Each band of DNA may contain millions of fragments of the same size. In many cases, a researcher may want to determine which DNA fragment contains a DNA sequence of interest. To do this, the researcher prepares the DNA in the gel to make a copy, known as a blot. First, the gel is soaked in a basic solution, so that the double-stranded DNA denatures into single strands. The gel is then transferred to a salt solution and a nylon filter is placed on top of the gel. Absorbent towels are placed on top of the filter. The salt solution draws the DNA through the gel toward the nylon filter, where the DNA adheres. The filter is treated so that the DNA adheres to it permanently, and then the filter is placed in a solution with a radioactive probe. The probe consists of single-stranded DNA that is complementary and will hybridize to the band of interest. The filter is washed to remove any unhybridized probe. A piece of X-ray film is placed over the filter. The radioactive probe exposes the film, revealing the locations of hybridization. Knowing which bands contain the sequence of interest, an identical agarose gel can be created, and a band of interest can be cut out of the gel. The DNA in this band can then be manipulated for further analysis.
Okay. <clears throat> so let's go over these steps um, for um, making a DNA fingerprint. First of all, um, you've got to obtain the DNA, and that's what we call DNA extraction. That's something we'll do in the lab and class. Um, you need to amplify the amount of DNA or make multiple copies of it, and you use PCR for that. You need to cut up the DNA with restriction enzymes so that you get uh, different fragment sizes for different individuals. And then you run those fragments across a gel using this process we call gel electrophoresis. Now, <clears throat> this is an actual image of an electrophoretic gel. This is a picture, and up here, these are the wells, so to speak, that were molded into the gel where you uh, actually physically inject the DNA. And <clears throat> the uh, negative terminal on the uh, electrode would have been up here on this side of the gel, and the positive terminal would have been down here. And please recall that DNA has negative phosphate groups, and so a negative, uh, negatively charged terminal would repel the DNA, whereas a positively charged terminal down here at the bottom of the gel would attract the DNA, and the DNA gets pushed across the gel or pulled across the gel, depending on the way you want to think about it, away from the wells. And because the um, fragments uh, that are smaller uh, have less obstacles as a way of thinking about it, um, uh, as they travel through the gel matrix, they travel further in the same amount of time that a larger fragment would. And so as you look at this gel, this is uh, probably your standard lane where you know particular sizes of gel fragments or DNA frag fragments, excuse me. And the longest DNA fragment is probably right here. And then some other DNA fragments that you know the size of are uh, smaller ones are farther away from the well. And so that, used a, that side is used as a marker to indicate how long or how big these different DNA fragments are from the different samples of DNA that were loaded into these different wells. This is another look at how you can run a gel. The animation that you saw earlier showed you a horizontally um, um, uh, oriented gel, and this is a vertically oriented gel. Uh, gels can be run in both ways. It just, you just load the DNA at one end and the DNA gets pushed across the gel, in this case from the top to the bottom. Um, and again, the smallest fragments tra travel the furthest. <clears throat> Now, look at this diagram. This is an x-ray film of, uh, taken of a uh, gel. Obviously, these little DNA fragments had radioactive probes associated with them, and the radioactivity was exposing the x-ray film. And so wherever the fragments are, are in the gel, uh, you get this white line in your x-ray film. Um, where do you think the wells were in this gel? Were they at the top or were they at the bottom? Pause the video and think about it. Okay, now that you're back, this... Um, top side is probably where the wells were and the reason you can tell that is because we have this marker lane over here and if you look at it this indicates 500 base pairs 500 BP and this is 100 base pairs and the thing that you need to remember is that the smaller fragments travel further on the gel and so what a gel electrophoresis does is it arrays DNA fragments according to size the smallest ones are farthest from the well and the largest fragments are closest to the wells where the DNA was originally loaded this is a DNA fingerprint situation for a forensic situation or a paternity situation. Uh, gel A, if you see the M, that stands for mother, the C stands for child, F1 stands for alleged father 1, and F2 stands for alleged father 2. And as you look at this, we look at the banding patterns that the mom has, and the child definitely has some similar bands that the mo mother does, which makes sense. And generally, it's not an issue to figure out who the mother of a child is. Although with surrogacy, you do sometimes need to genetically prove that who the biological mother is. Um, usually, the parent that's in question is who's the baby's daddy, right? Who's, who's the father? And if we look at this child and F1, father 1, there are multiple bands that the child has in common with F1, but there are multiple bands that F2 has that the child does not have. And, and so this gel would indicate to us with this D DNA fingerprint analysis that F1 is probably, is most likely, um, or very likely, I should say, the actual biological father of the child. Gel B over here, this is a crime scene evidence gel. And um, perhaps we have a victim, and um, that victim was attacked or assaulted in some way. In many instances, a victim can have uh, tissue from his or her attacker underneath the fingernails because sometimes people fight back and they scratch and you get skin from the attacker underneath the fingernails. So a specimen can be taken from underneath the fingernails. Uh, there's other variety of ways that a specimen can be collected from a victim, of course. And um, 
what you're going to do is do a DNA fingerprint analysis from the specimen and run it against some suspects that you have. And as this gel would indicate, suspect one has very similar banding pattern with the specimen. And so it is likely here that suspect one was in fact the attacker for this victim. Now, <clears throat> the next screencast session is going to be all about the promise of gene therapy. That's enough for right now. Uh, we'll see you next time, ladies and gentlemen.